Welcome back to Combat Mission Shock Force, where we're going to take a look at the T-72 and its variants. We're going to kick off with a little historical background and then move on to the technical details of each different type, their points cost, the relative advantages and disadvantages. The story of the T-72 really starts off with the T-64. This was the Soviet Union's high quality second generation main battle tank of the Cold War, a design which aimed to produce a heavy tank in a medium tank sized package. To do this the T-64 incorporated a lot of advanced features. The human loader was replaced with a mechanical auto loader reducing the crew to three and this along with a more compact engine significantly reduced the internal volume of the tank allowing it to be shrunk down and be fitted with more armor for the same weight as larger previous tanks. When compared to the contemporary T-62 the T-64 was more heavily armed and more heavily armoured whilst being considerably smaller. The downside to this was that it was very expensive and the smaller engine design suffered some problems. To sidestep these issues, the Soviets prepared a much simplified war mobilisation design. In the event of war, production of the advanced high-tech high-quality model would stop and production of the cheaper, simpler mobilisation model would start in order to maximise the use of resources and vastly increase the speed and volume of production. With the production of the T-64 proving disappointingly expensive and suffering from a serious bottleneck due to the slow manufacture of its complicated engine, when the designers responsible for the mobilisation model were able to incorporate a different engine that was cheaper, easier to produce and more reliable, they got a lot of attention. The result was that this new model was approved for peacetime production as the T-72. In terms of combat record, the T-72 has had the misfortune of only seeing significant combat in the Middle East, where lower quality export models, crewed by poorly trained soldiers, have been generally poorly handled. The results against Israeli, US and coalition forces have been broadly catastrophic, though this is less a reflection of the quality of the T-72 itself, and much more a reflection of the quality of the Syrian and Iraqi armies. So that's a quick and relatively loose version of where the T-72 came from. There are six different variants of T-72 in Combat Mission Shock Force, and while there are some significant differences between them, being variants they all share some core characteristics. They are all armed with the 125mm D81 or 2A46 gun. To get an indication of how effective this is, we can see how it performs against the M2A3 Bradley with explosive reactive armour, and the M1A2 set Abrams. In terms of protection, these two are broadly comparable to the other top tier NATO infantry fighting vehicles and main battle tanks the T-72 will be facing in standard blue versus red battles. The target vehicles are 1000 meters out, which is a reasonably long range for most combat mission maps. This is a pretty loose test, but it should give a general feeling for how the gun stacks up against its likely targets. The Bradley can be penetrated from any angle out to the full kilometre, so NATO infantry fighting vehicles aren't a problem. Unsurprisingly, the Abrams are significantly tougher. At the full kilometre, frontal hits are unable to reliably penetrate, though subsystems like radios, targeting systems, optics and the main gun can all be degraded or disabled. Advancing the Abrams to the 500 meter mark and then the 250 meter line maintains the same results. The T-72s aren't getting penetrating hits on any of the frontal armor. This doesn't mean that engaging at this range is pointless. By this time several of the Abrams have been immobilized by track damage or lost their ability to fight and of course there is always the possibility of lucky hits finding a weak point and getting inside. Despite this, the T-72 can reliably penetrate the flank of the M1A2 set at 1000 meters, both in the hull and the turret sides. So catching enemy tanks in the flank is going to be effective. Theoretically, the main gun can be fired four times a minute, or four times in a turn, though this can be as low as one round a minute. This is usually due to the blast effect of the main gun kicking up dust. If the ground is dry and the wind is unkind, then most variants will find themselves temporarily blinded by firing their own gun. Ammunition comes in three main flavours, armour piercing fin stabilised discarding sabo, high explosive anti-tank and straight high explosive. Ammunition counts vary a little with earlier variants having 39 rounds and later ones having 44, 
but ammunition types are generally split about 50-50 between high explosive and anti-tank. Fire control systems vary slightly between the variants, but they all use laser range finding. Backing up the 125mm main gun is a PKT coaxial machine gun with over 2,000 rounds and a pintle mounted 12.7 NSV machine gun with 300 armor piercing incendiary rounds. The pintle mount is on the commander's hatch and can only be operated manually, so he won't fire it unless he's opened up and exposed to enemy fire. Speaking of opening up, the commander is the only one who will do so, and with most of his torso out of the hatch, it's not exactly a very safe opened up position. Speaking of safety, we can reverse the target test from earlier to get an indication of how much protection the T-72 has. Neither the 120mm Weimatal gun on the M1A2 SEP nor the Bradley's tow missiles have any problem whatsoever making frontal penetrations at the full kilometer, and while the 25mm Bushmaster cannon isn't capable of penetrating most of the frontal armor, it can score partial penetrations of the lower front hull at 1000 meters and full pens on the side armor, though post penetration damage seems pretty low at this distance. In terms of infantry anti tank weapons, the T 72's sides and rear are vulnerable to like AT weapons like the Law 66 and the AT 4, but while these can sometimes get past the frontal armor if they hit a weak spot, just like the 25mm shells, they're not guaranteed to do much once they punch through. Anything that does get through the armor with enough force to do damage is a problem though. One of the downsides to having a compact tank is that all the internal components are crammed in together, so penetrations are likely to hit something important. The biggest issue here is the ammunition, which is kept in a circular carousel in the base of the tank where the autoloader mechanism can access it. And given its position in the vehicle, if the ammo goes up, then the tank is a total loss. Combat mission doesn't animate anything so spectacular, but a common side effect of a ammo carousel detonation is the turret popping off the tank. These are the core characteristics of the T-72, and given the situation that the tank finds itself in shock force, there are some obvious shortcomings. Some of these are addressed by different variants, but it's important to bear in mind two caveats. First of all, the design philosophy of the T-72 does not fit easily into the situation of the average combat mission game. Tank designers in the Soviet Union didn't draw the same lessons from World War II that NATO tank designers did. In their experience, victory was the result of large-scale operational maneuver and they produced tanks with that in mind. When considering the nuclear battlefields of the Cold War, numbers, speed and the rapid ruthless exploitation of its success were going to be the critical factors. Combat mission battlefields are far too small for this kind of tank to perform in its intended role. This doesn't mean that the T-72 was put together blindly. It was at least a match for NATO's main battle tanks when it was designed, and since the 1970s it has been consistently upgraded to try and keep pace with technical and technological developments. This leads into the second point, which is that in Shock Force we are dealing with the T-72s of the Syrian army. Not only are these T-72s lower quality export variants, but the Syrians still have many older, non-upgraded versions in their inventory, and even the most advanced is lagging far behind the NATO armor of 2008. Syria has no ability to produce its own tanks, and doesn't have the economic strength to indulge in more import purchases every time there is an upgraded variant available, so they keep hold of all the tanks they've got. When more advanced or more capable tanks are acquired, these go to the Republican Guard, who shunt their existing tanks down to the regular army, and the regular army shunt theirs down to the militia. Nothing is replaced. Just as the Syrian army maintains numbers of T-55s despite having T-72s, they maintain early T-72 variants despite having later models. So while all the T-72s are outclassed by the various NATO main battle tanks they're likely to face here, some of them are significantly less outclassed than others. This brings us on to the variants themselves. There are six of these in ascending order of effectiveness. The T-72M early, the T-72M, the T-72M1, and the T-72AV. Then we have further upgrades of the N1 and AV with the Terms T fire control system. The T-72M early is the base model, 
with a standard crew, so one with regular experience and no other modifiers to leadership or motivation, it weighs in at 228 points and can be found in Syrian reserve tank companies, which should give you some indication of how effective it is. The T-72M variant has had smoke launchers added. These are Soviet-style smoke launchers which create a smoke screen about 150 meters out in whatever direction the turret is facing. This is so that the tank gains room to maneuver and can continue offensive action without binding itself. This is notably different to NATO-style smoke launchers which deploy smoke immediately around the vehicle to mask it quickly and allow it to pull back and reposition. The smoke itself is not multispectral, so it doesn't block thermal sights, so while the T-72 can't see through it, most NATO main battle tanks, vehicles and anti-tank weapons can, which is definitely something to bear in mind. The T-72M costs 232 points standard, so obviously the smoke launchers aren't increasing the combat power of the vehicle in any significant way. But at least it's not in reserve, it's an option for Syrian tank companies. Next up is the T-72M-1. This is a T-72M which has had extra armour fitted to the turret front and glacy. I haven't noticed this making any difference, but more armour is always nice. More importantly, this variant has a higher ammunition count. The previous two models could carry 39 rounds of ammunition, and the T-72M1 carries 44. This makes it slightly more expensive than the previous two at 242 points, and it is again one of the variant options available to tank companies. The T-72AV is a T-72M1 equipped with an explosive reactive armour package. The blocks cover the front and sides of the hull and the front of the turret and make the tank considerably more resistant to infantry anti-tank weapons with single stage warheads like RPGs, Law 66s and 84s. They also add some protection against smaller calibre projectiles like cannon shells, but they're not much help against tandem heat warheads and NATO tanks. And obviously they only work against a hits actually striking the era blocks, hits on the rear flanks the rear of the tank and the sides, rear and rear roof of the turret are obviously not intercepted. The smoke launchers have been removed to make way for the era blocks, but overall the cost has jumped significantly up to 290 points standard. The era package does have a considerable impact on the effectiveness of the tank. It is the most advanced variant that can be found as an option for Syrian tank companies. The top tier of Syrian T-72s in Combat Mission Shock Force 2 though are the variants of the M1 and AV featuring the Terms T upgrade. Terms T stands for Tank Universal Reconfiguration Modular System T series and it adds straight out of the manual a day-night stabilized commander's panoramic periscope sight, gunner's stabilized sight with thermal imager, laser rangefinder and a digital fire control computer. These are not trivial upgrades. The thermal imager is obviously extremely useful, not least because the gunner will no longer be blinded by dust when he fires, but the increased accuracy from the new fire control system and the improved spotting from the commander's new optics are significant in and of themselves. The Terms T variants are easily distinguished by the new sights on the turret roof, but have one trick up their sleeves that is not immediately obvious. They are capable of firing AT-11 ATGMs from their main guns. This may seem a little weird, but being self-propelled, these missiles allow the T-72 to engage targets up to 5,000 meters away. The AT-11 is a beam-riding Saklos type ATGM, so while it has a longer flight time than something like a Sabo round, it can be guided onto the target and because it has a tandem-shaped charge warhead, its ability to penetrate armour is the same no matter the range, with the added benefit that it can get through explosive reactive armour. The downside is that the added capability of the AT-11 doesn't translate into combat mission very well. Most of the maps are too small for it to shine, Actually spotting a target 5 kilometers away is pretty tough, and hanging around in full view in order to guide the missile onto the target is not very survival enhancing. Unlike the other T-72 variants, the Terms T models are restricted to the Republican Guard and can only be found in Guard's tank companies, with the T-72M1 Terms T weighing in at 308 points standard and the T-72AV Terms T at 372. 
To give these numbers some relevance in the bigger picture, the points cost is a reflection of a unit's combat power. The same standard points cost for the Abrams variants run from 407 to 466 points, the base Challenger 2 is 485, and the German, Canadian and Dutch Leopard 2 variants run from 504 points to 586. Those numbers are, however, based on the technical values alone and don't take into account tactics. We've already seen that even the T-72M early can destroy an Abrams at 1000 meters if it gets a flanking shot in. The trick is getting into position to find that angle without being spotted first. This is an exercise in using the terrain to mask approaches or provide defilade in keyhole positions, the use of shoot and scoot to minimize exposure, and the use of combined arms to shield the T-72s from enemy infantry closing in, to spot targets, and as much as possible, to get that degrading fire in on NATO tanks and vehicles to reduce their effectiveness so that when the time comes, the T-72s have the best chance. It's no use talking about any tank in isolation. They need support from the infantry, artillery, and, if ever possible, air power, if they're going to function effectively. Of course, this kind of careful handling is obviously not new or unique to the T-72. This is how all tanks and vehicles should be handled. The difference is that while something like an Abrams or a Leopard have the spotting ability and frontal armor to get away with a few mistakes, the T-72 is a lot less forgiving. It's still more forgiving than the T-55 and T-62 though, and the Terms T variants are the most capable tanks in the Syrian arsenal, with the possible exception of the T-90SA from the Marines module, which is basically a T-72 anyway. As ever, if you're picking a force in the Quick Battle Selector, it's an exercise in bringing the units that fit into your plan and your appreciation of the map. In some circumstances, the T-72 is going to be a better choice than these other Syrian armor options, in others, perhaps not so much. Without the Terms T upgrade, it's not actually that much more expensive than the modernized T-55 MV and T-62 MV models, while packing a more powerful gun into a lower profile. The T-72 M1 and T-72 AV Terms T variants are a little pricier, but thermal optics are a major advantage, and in any case, they're still cheaper than NATO tanks, so you should be able to put more armor onto the field if that's what you want to do. As with most Syrian units, at typical values in the force selector, T-72s are likely to come out of the box as green or conscript with poor leadership. This makes them cheaper, but the key thing to remember about tank warfare is that he who spots first and gets the first shot off almost always wins, so having a larger number of cheaper conscript crews is not necessarily an advantage. They might never see the enemy at all. So that is Shock Force's T-72 in its many forms. Overshadowed by NATO armor, as you might expect, but overall it's a solid and capable piece of hardware. I'd argue that it needs capable handling to get the most out of it, but it's absolutely worth treating with respect as an opponent. That's it for this short unit guide, hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.